It's my great honor and pleasure to welcome everyone at the Conrad Festival. Uh, my guests are Irene Gammel, uh, literary historian, biographer, and curator, and author of a very interesting, inspiring book uh, on Elsa Freitag, von Freitag uh, Loringhofen, uh, Zuzanna Janin, artist and initiator of an award, uh, a word named after uh, her mother and uh, after uh, Elsa von Freitag Loringhofen, and Anna Markowska, uh, art historian and author of amazing book about uh, Marcel Duchamp with a very original title, uh, Why is it that Duchamp never parted his hair? <laughs> uh, this discussion is a part of a bigger project uh, named Lady Dada. The project is devoted to Elsa von Freitag Loringhofen. And this project is organized by uh, Dom Norimberski and curator, curated by Renata uh, Copito. It consists of uh, international exhibition of works inspired by Elsa von Freitag Lorinthofen, by her uh, art and poetry, uh, and of a theater play uh, directed by Iga Gancharczyk. It will be presented next year in 2021. And of this discussion, which is also a part of Conrad Festival, uh, its additional program. Uh, Conrad is international literary festival of which I am one of directors. This discussion, our discussion, has a title over War Over Urinal. And this title refers to one artwork, two artists, and one controversy. The artwork is Fountain uh, from 1917, uh, ready-made, attributed to Marcel uh, Duchamp. Artists are Marcel Duchamp himself and Elsa von Freitag Lorinhofen, I mentioned uh, before. And the con controversy started with Irene Gamel's book, in which there is a hypothesis that Elsa could have something to do with creation of uh, Richard Matt's um, uh, Fountain. This hypothesis was later used by art historians, curators, critics, and even writers for further discussions. Some of them uh, suggested that we should rewrite uh, 20th century, uh, the, the history of 20th century art because there is one very important person missing, uh, an author of uh, Fonten, Elsa von Freitag Lorinthofen. So once again, welcome to all of you. Thank you for accepting our invitation to be a part of this discussion. Thank you so much. My first question goes to Irene. Uh, your book taught us how to perceive Elsa von Freitag in a different way. Uh, why was it so difficult for the cultural world to recognize her as an important figure uh, of Dada movement and of modern art in general? Thank you so much for that question. And um, may I also just say, I hope we'll come back to these authorship questions because they are very intricate questions. And uh, I feel there is a lot of misinformation out on that front. So I really look forward to help clarify that a little bit as well. But to enter your question now, the uh, difficulty for Elsa von Freitag Loringhofen was multifold. I think the shortest answer probably is that there was a, a good portion of systemic misogyny that really prevented Elsa and women like Elsa from taking a full share within the modernist uh, era within the modernist art historical canon and even within the most avant-garde circles of the time. Women were, during the era at least, still perceived to be the partners of uh, male artists 
at best they were contributors to their art and so in a way women had to fight during this time in order to be heard in order to show their work and uh, be recognized by art historians by dealers achieve any sort of value for their art as well and i think added to that uh, we might also say that women didn't necessarily mimic the male canon. They had their own ways of expressing themselves. So often the artwork was a bit different. In the Baroness's case, for example, it was a very corporeal art. It was a performance art in many ways. Today we see her very much as someone who lived Dada, as uh, somebody very prescient, Jane Heap at the time, recognized. And so in that sense, there were multiple reasons, I think, for her disappearance, including also her early death. In 1927, she was just, she had just been working on her legacy for about two years when she died in Paris. And we don't even know exactly how she died. We know it was gas asphyxiation, but we don't know was this uh, uh, a suicidal gesture, was it an accident, more likely an accident, uh, but we don't even know that. But all to say, she didn't really have those decades in order to create a legacy for herself, a legacy that others were able to create during this time. So and I could go on, there are more reasons than that, but I think this gives you a little bit of uh, insight into the Baroness. And how did it happen that you decided to write a book about her? I came to her uh, circuitously. I did not stumble over the Baroness uh, on her own, but precisely through the journey of a partner, and that was her German husband, Felix Paul Greve, who um, had immigrated um, or, or escaped Germany because he had debt in Germany, uh, went to the United States, and from there went to Canada. And he asked Elsa to follow him, and that brought her over to the US in the first place. Felix Paul Greve later on became Frederick Philip Grove, a very highly established realist author in Canada. And I actually completed my PhD thesis on Felix Paul Greve slash Frederick Philip Grove. And in doing research on this and completing my dissertation, I happened upon the Baroness. I traveled to the University of Maryland where her papers are held and discovered the treasure trove and discovered somebody who totally distracted me from my dissertation because she was just so much more interesting than uh, Felix Paul Greve, who was a bit more stuffy and certainly in Canada was very much sort of into family values and so on. Um, although, as we found out later on, he had his own separate side and shadow side as well because he faked an identity that was not really true he pretended to be who he uh, wasn't he received the, uh, canada's highest honor for writing a work of non-fiction when it turned out to be entirely fictionalized and uh, so in 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 that sense um felix paul greve was was kind of the conduit for me and then elsa uh, took off and Elsa became the primary subject. And what is the perspective of uh, literary historians? Uh, do they recognize her as important figure of uh, literary movements of that time? She was an author of poems, uh, publishing um, uh, alongside James Joyce, June Barnes, and so on and so forth. So how do uh, literary historians uh, perceive her literary work? Very good question, and I would say that it, the, the, the path of acceptance was exactly the same as it was for her visual art or her performance art. She was long forgotten. She was forgotten for decades throughout the 20th century. The interest, at least forgotten by art historians, literary historians, and so on. That said, what I've always found interesting was that the artists, the writers, the editors of the era, did not forget her. They inserted their memories of her in the memoirs that they wrote. And that's why we have a lot of really interesting anecdotes. Many of them recalled um, during the 1930s, 1950s, even 1960s. And so 
a lot of the information that we have available is fragmentary material based on these memoirs. At the same time, certainly in the biography, I always try to return and ask myself what was the earliest, uh, closest source of evidence. And I found that the closest sources of evidence were typically letters. So there are also quite a few letters. I'm currently working on a letter edition uh, of the Baroness's work. There are many, many letters that she left behind. And so that is an interesting resource as well also a resource that kind of shows her experimental style in expressing herself. But coming back to your question, um, the trajectory was very much the same. That is forgotten for a long time. And then a sort of a rebirth, a resurgence during the 1990s. In 1992, her biography came out, her autobiography came out here in Canada, actually. and. Um, in 1997 um, or 1996, 97, a very important exhibition, which was Making Mischief, Dada Invades New York. I actually have the exhibition catalog right here. There it is. While she was not included in the exhibition catalog, she, her work made it into the exhibition. Her work was late, and so they weren't able to include her at the time. But one of the co-curators, Francis Nauman, has been a champion of her for many decades. And uh, uh, he also alerted me to, to some additional artwork that I was then able to incorporate into the biography, which came out in 2002. And that was a 10 year project for me. It was a difficult project, and, but it was a worthwhile project. And uh, one of those projects that you kind of can't let go. I didn't have a mandate to work on this. In fact, I had been hired in the meantime as a professor to teach and study and research Canadian literature. I was supposed to stay on Grove, but uh, the Baroness certainly captured me uh, with her attention and I simply continued on the side. And so it was a lengthy project, uh, but uh, a, a project that, uh, that was a very important one because it was kind of helping lift someone who was a footnote of history uh, into a bit of the limelight. To understand uh, the controversy and to uh, clarify uh, all the, the misconceptions and mistakes made by uh, those who were engaged in uh, debates, discussions, we have to come back to the very beginning, to 1917 uh, and to Fonten. Anna, uh, the question is for you. Uh, Marcel Duchamp's uh, artwork, Fonten, is presented as work of the century. It was recognized by art historians and critics as the most influential work created in 20th century. It went, that's um, something we have to um, understand. Why is it? What is a foundation of uh, its prestige and acknowledgement and what, it's, what is its influence upon art? Yes, uh, it is a very good question because um, it is something unexpected, in fact, <laughs> what happened with the fountain, that um, it is so famous now. But please let me um, uh, give some introductory remark. One is about uh, gender data and everyday modernity, because it is extremely uh, supportive book, not only because um, it reveals um, uh, the possibility that maybe uh, Baroness Elsa was um, one of the authors of, or the only author of The Fountain, but it is very sub, uh, supportive for women uh, reading the book because it is so easy to say such uh, cliche that she was kleptomaniac, crazy, uh, mad, and all this stuff which are usually uh, uh, women are described when they are thinking out of the box. And nothing like, like that happened in this book. Uh, we can read that she was simply uh, in, uh, very inspirational 
and um, that she wasn't derivative. So this is a wonderful strategy, yes? Um, and uh, I, 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 I am deeply convinced it should be translated into Polish because of her uh, uh, Polish, in fact, a little bit uh, roots, yes? So I really dream about it. I am based in Wrocław, which was uh, Breslau before the war, and his first, uh, Baroness' first hu husband is uh, uh, from uh, Breslau because he was uh, director of the uh, academy there. So uh, there are so many links with Poland, and it is so uh, extremely supportive book that I really dream of, um, of, of tran translation. And then coming back to Dada, uh, well, Poland never uh, fits to general universal art history, and this is also the case of Dadaism. Uh, so let me also localize for a moment our discussion. We are, um, uh, we are based in Poland. I have already told about Świnominde, which is now Świnoujście, where she was born, about uh, Wrocław, which was Breslau, where her first husband uh, was a very uh, important uh, personality and professor of the academy. So uh, uh, um, uh, uh, let me give another remark about uh, very specific situation of Dada in Poland because uh, Dada is against um, uh, belligerent masculinity, against nationalism and again against great war. And in fact, great war was for Poland um, a, a hope for independence, which uh, it really regained in 1918. So, uh, uh, we cannot find too much data in Polish history, in fact, it, it is almost absent. I know about one um, artist, Marceli Słodki, who, who participated in Zurich Dada, uh, who was murdered in a uh, gas chamber in Auschwitz. And as uh, your, your question is about prestige and acknowledgement of uh, Duchamp, and I know only one sign uh, piece of art in Poland, in private collection, this is a bottle rack, and one exhibition in 1981, uh, which was curated by a Polish art historian, uh, art, art, not art historian, uh, Polish uh, artist, Zdzisław Susnowski, now based in um, uh, Paris. So, well, prestige maybe, but uh, in Poland with the Champ, it's not so uh, obvious, yes? And coming back to, um, to the fountain, which is so important for us in our uh, today's discussion. It is quite obvious that submitting the fountain in the exhibition of uh, modern art was um, uh, behind uh, this submittance was the idea of testing uh, the clandestine uh, um, rules because it was obvious that everybody could pay uh, six dollars um, uh, can enter the exhibition but it has turned out that uh, maybe the rule is no jury no prizes but uh, uh, practically, it, it has turned out that uh, the fountain was not accessible uh, for, for the uh, public and it rests behind the curtain during the whole exhibition. So obviously, uh, when we think about uh, freedom of expression, about revealing clandestine uh, consensual agreement, we might, we might say that uh, the conviction of beauty, uh, the, the idea of beauty is not innocent because uh, um, jury said that uh, the urinal is vulgar, yes? And in fact, uh, it is not only vulgarity at stake, but uh, there, are, uh, there is some a system of gender, class, uh, hierarchy, which uh, lies behind pure aesthetic. 
So I think that this testing of uh, clandestine unspoken rules is something which developed uh, very soon, um, not maybe very soon, but after the war, in institutional uh, critique. So very important strategy of the neo-avant-garde of the 60s and 70s. But we have another um, path of thinking about the fountain. This is a path of uh, thinking about fresh air, about irrationality, about uh, something which is uh, a surprise, a prank, a humor, which uh, opposes, uh, there is a wonderful uh, book by uh, Amelia Jones about new, uh, neurasthenic uh, and irrational avant-garde, yes? So, uh, at stake is also this male rational uh, um, um, stiff uh, <laughs> uh, rationalism which uh, in which some people cannot breathe <laughs> and this is a problem and I will add also that um, um, displacing uh, uh, things um, uh, is about uh, participation and about uh, not only looking at, at them um, uh, in a passive way, but to join to the game. And this is uh, so wonderful. So this is, of course, about democracy and about the spark which everyone has in uh, ourselves. So uh, this is not like, uh, well, that there are artists who are genius, yes, and, uh, and other people who are, uh, is, uh, should be passive and uh, only hear and be submissive. So it is against uh, submissive, uh, submissiveness, I think. Okay, <laughs> but well, um, uh, maybe uh, thinking um, about uh, Elsa in this context, we have uh, these uh, two points. First is that the submittance was not possibly not only was uh, with done by uh, um, Duchamp himself, because we know that he prob probably uh, did it with help of uh, his friends. And in fact, everything we know about the fountain, we know from Duchamp his, himself. So uh, his fantasy might be great. It is uh, really... Um, um, veil, the, 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 the situation of submittance is veiled in a, in a huge enigma, yes? And uh, I think that Baroness um, uh, has uh, shown the limitation of that game for freedom, yes? Because it was a masculine game, in fact. So this is uh, uh, how I, I see it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Irene, uh, what could be Freitag's role in the process uh, of uh, creation, uh, the process of creating uh, Fountain? Very good question. And of course, it is a question that invites speculation. And I think one of the things with the current controversy is that I think we, we want to be careful not to add to, um, to false information. So that, that's one thing. So in terms of what we truly know, in other words, what is it that we can sink our teeth in and say, here is something that we need to talk about, is I think number one, what Anna already mentioned, there is a bit of an enigma around the creation of this object in the first place. We know through Marcel Duchamp, uh, through a letter in June of 1917, that uh, way he said to his uh, sister Suzanne in Paris, that a female friend had submitted this sculpture under the pseudonym uh, R. Mutt or Richard Mutt. And uh, so we have that particular statement. And there are two ways of reading that statement. There is the way of reading it, Duchamp was simply making this up, or uh, in order to add to this enigma, or we, and that's the position that is taken by many, including, for example, Francis Nauman, and so on. Uh, or we say, well, maybe there is something 
to the statement. Maybe somebody else was involved. And there is certainly evidence when we look at the origin of fountain, when we look at the evolution of fountain, fountain was not an object that uh, was produced uh, with the genius flash from one day to the next. It was something that evolved a very, a very slowly in the course of the 20th century. The important moment certainly was this sort of confrontation with the Society of the Independent Artists in 1917, which was supposed to be, as Anna already mentioned, um, with no jury, no prizes, it was supposed to follow a whole new democratic principle. Uh, artworks in alphabetical order, etc., etc. It was supposed to cut through all of the various old crusted, encrusted systems and was supposed to create something much more democratic to really offer uh, a showing of uh, modern works as they were being produced. And uh, so in that sense, the uh, idea of fountain emerging within that context, there is certainly this element of a joke there, which is as Catherine Dreyer, one of the board members had read it at the time. And uh, so there was a kind of protective gesture on the part of the board. We don't, we don't want this, our exhibition that we worked so hard for, uh, made fun of. And so this kind of contributed toward the rejection of the piece itself. And it was, as Duchamp always um, highlighted, he said it was not a rejection because they had nothing to reject, because there was no jury, et cetera, et cetera. So what they did, and Duchamp was very adamant about this until late in life, he said it was a suppression. So in other words, a censorship of sorts. And of course, this story of a censorship is also one that can add to a, a, an art object or even a literary works. Um, career in a way. Yeah, often when we have works such as James Joyce's Ulysses, it all starts with the story of suppression. So it is an element that, that is important. And some people have argued that Duchamp deliberately uh, created this particular scenario and was actually very happy that it was rejected at the time. In terms of the other aspect of a fountain that I find very interesting is that to me fountain presents a work in which we, we definitely don't have just one genius brain or artist that created it. It was something that could happen only within a broader artistic and social context. And within that context, I would like to draw attention not only to uh, the multiple women that have been cited as possible, um, as possibly having been involved in shipping this, uh, this object, but I would also like to, perhaps before we get to these women even, point to someone like Alfred Stieglitz. Stieglitz was essential in this entire situation because the artwork itself is lost today. All we have available and what was used in the course of 20th century discussions was a famous photograph that he had taken in 1917, staging a urinal on a pedestal with uh, Marston Hartley's uh, painting, a Warriors in the background. That painting and, and that um, photograph were used later on in further discussions, defenses, and so on, in order to construct this work as a revolutionary 20th century artwork. It's also interesting that this particular uh, staging of the work and the photograph itself in essence contradict quite a bit what Duchamp was hoping to do. Duchamp was hoping to propel an anti-aesthetic, whereas what the photograph does, when you look at the photograph, it's a photograph of a beautiful art object. We don't just see a urinal. What we see is something that is carefully staged as a work of art. It kind of underwent even a transformation. It was discussed within the pages of the blind man, 
that is the avant-garde journal that helped promote this object at the time and provided a platform for these critical discussions that add to the construction of fountain. Within this context, it was discussed as the sort of Madonna of the bathroom and the Buddha of the bathroom. In other words, there was a kind of spiritualizing, aestheticizing that went along with it. Totally different from any Duchampian agenda. And I find that contrast really very interesting. And my theory has always been that Fountain would never have become the kind of mainstream uh, work of art that it is today, had it not been for these deliberate and totally contradictory gestures of aestheticizing. And the, what's finally interesting is that the staging of Fountain that Duchamp would perform later in life came closer and closer and closer to Alfred Stieglitz's photograph. I find that extremely telling that Duchamp himself recognized this kind of, that the legacy was linked to this particular positioning. And that was the one on the tall pedestal uh, with the, um, uh, as, as Stieglitz had, had, uh, had presented it. So that's one aspect of it, that the construction of this uh, work of art through 20th century discussions. And when you look at these discussions, they also often repeat the original discussions that had taken place within the context of the blind man in 1917. Several people contributed to these discussions. One of them was Alfred Stieglitz himself. He saw this very much as a fight against censorship. Yeah, he was very serious about this. So he also contributed a letter. And there were others. Louise Norton, for example, who also, whose address is on the little label that we see and who was the lover of Duchamp at the time. So she contributed a lengthy discussion on this situating the work of art within a sort of intellectual, Western intellectual history. Duchamp later on poked fun at that because he could see that this was again the same kind of elevation that he was actually working against. But these were some of the arguments that were circulated later on. And so my point is that there was a kind of collaborative construction of fountain that um, we witnessed throughout the, the 20th century. And where the Baroness comes in, I was simply struck at the time by Duchamp's letter, 1917, a female friend has submitted this, and I said, okay, if we take Duchamp seriously, and truly a female friend was involved in here, here are some of the arguments that make the Baroness a very good candidate. And there, there are a whole number of them, including the fact that at the time there was discussion within newspapers that the fountain originated from Philadelphia. And the Baroness was in Philadelphia. We can put her there 100%. I documented this multiple times. The most evident source is George Biddle in 1917. Uh, it's very clearly dated. And uh, we also know that at that point, she was already close friends with Duchamp. We don't know exactly when those two met, but we know for a fact that by 1917, by the time of the independence, after the Baroness had left New York, she already intensely engaged with his work. She had made multiple uh, color portraits of him. Unfortunately, they are lost today, but we have them documented and described in detail in George Biddle's memoir. So there is that connection to Philadelphia. There is also the shared aesthetic the Baroness stood for a very scatological aesthetic. This was something very uh, new, very uncomfortable, and it kind of erupted also on the pages of the little review via um, James Joyce's Ulysses. And the Baroness uh, was a, a practitioner of this particular aesthetic. 
and we find it reflected again in the sculpture God, which he made in 1917 in collaboration with Philadelphia artist Morton Schomburg. And uh, God being made of a uh, plumbing fixture, bathroom plumbing fixture, uh, that uh, she apparently ripped out and declared to be God and that was mounted on a mitre box. And one assumes that it was mounted by Schomburg because it's very neatly done. And then it's also been painted with a gloss, evidently also by Morton Schomburg because these types of aspects are not really what the Baroness herself did. Um, so there are all these elements and there were other elements as well in terms of uh, um, the fact that the work was submitted late, uh, didn't make it into the catalog, etc, etc. And the Baroness notoriously being late. Uh, there is also the, the discussion of our mutt, which is a very interesting way of uh, phrasing it. Um, I've linked it to the armut, the poverty uh, of the Baroness. Uh, there is also a connection there to the uh, Urmutta, which was part of the German uh, avant-garde setup. They were very interested at the time. Uh, this was, this was a, a period, turn of the century, that the Baroness went through in Germany. And uh, she actually despised the circle, this, this circle of male feminists in uh, Berlin and um, uh, Munich, uh, but we still see the influences in her work itself. So there, there were a whole lot of elements that pointed to the Baroness. That said, it is a speculative case because what we don't have is the Baroness coming up and claiming this work. Uh, whereas Duchamp very clearly did claim it incorporated it into his work into multiple replicas yeah from early on and um, also claimed it uh, very explicitly as part of his legacy so all of that is is kind of and of course the baroness died in 1927 so she could not be part of those discussions so that's uh, that's that's another question um but all to say uh it's a complex issue. Fountain was not born overnight, but was a slow process. And shipping it in does not constitute singular authorship. So I would certainly say that, that, is, that those are elements that most people can agree on within this discussion. And then there are different areas where we may come on in our own positioning regarding this particular work of art. And in my view, it is a very interesting work of art, especially given the kinds of uh, um, provocations and discussions that it elicits. Anna said uh, that when we consider Dada art, uh, when we enter the field of art, uh, we encounter a certain game controlled by males. Susanna Janin decided to change the game, change the rules of the game, uh, initiating um, this award named after Elsa von Freitag Lorinthofen. Susanna, I want to, I want you to uh, explain why. Uh, you decided to create this award and why did you choose uh, Elsa uh, as its patron? Um, yeah, it was really, really extremely interesting to listen what you said before me, Irene and Anna, thank you very much. Uh, some of this I wanted to also mention, especially about the God sculpture, which for me as an artist is a it's a really um, a way of treating uh, this very um, banal uh, everyday, well, not maybe everyday, but these uh, tool, tools uh, which are plumbing tools into the uh, 
uh, art materials. I think it's a very, very big step also connected with the modernity as we think about architecture, which also changed architecture into the very practical structure. Also sculpture and art become place when artists are using something very practical to change meaning and also to bring our focus into the everyday life and maybe even I would say this urinal and this all this plumbing sculpture could be a way of certain social sculpture introducing into the into the history of art like you know tell you imagine uh, cities in the beginning of 20th century they are starting to use the running water as every house has to have a toilet every house has to have a running uh, it cannot be totally not seen by artists especially by you know this kind of craziness people who brings everything who their life and their life become an art and uh, environment becomes themselves etc yeah i i intu intuitionally as an artist i see elsa von freitag as this kind of person and probably discussion and inspiring each other with all these tools ready-made uh, uh, all this stuff i think was the way they suddenly decided to make it like this and uh, i was actually very inspired and uh, observing as a von Freitag. I don't remember now when I found her, but uh, but I I was uh, really surprised how early she started to use this um, plumbing, for example, this pipe, uh, this banal, you know, trashy thing. And when I was doing my work, um, big project, which was um, uh, house uh, home transformed into um, geometrical bases. I I um, I was thinking about her doing this, and uh, and all this project was uh, connected with my uh, my first studio, which was also my mother my mother place, and uh, step by step I. I noticed that uh, the day of my mother, uh, the, the, the birthday, the date of my mother's birth, uh, which is 15th of December, is also a date of Elsa von Freitag's death. And then suddenly these two women, like my mother, who is a, also an artist coming from um, modernism uh, tradition. She, she comes from the uh, surrealism, but um, it's not strictly surrealism, although she was uh, she was called surrealistic, uh, uh, metaphorical, uh, metaphor, uh, metaphorialistic artist, naive and and sort of surrealist or post surrealist or um, post modernism artist, very very alone in the after after the Second um, World War tradition in Poland, which was fully abstract or almost abstract, not maybe fully, but conceptualism and abstract uh, art was much more uh, visible. And uh, we know now that a lot of women like uh, Leonor um, um, of, um, oh, I suddenly forgot her, uh, uh, Carrington, Leonor Carrington, for example, she was, she was sort of hidden in the hidden place for a very long time, yeah, but also doing the figurative surrealist painting. So then, uh, um, uh, you know, these this two women, two women, my mother, as a separate, not only that my ma, it was my mother, because artistically we, together we don't have lots of common. I'm doing completely different thing and my attitude to art, to thinking about the space and, and ob object, subject uh, is completely different than my mother, but still is a heritage. And um, after her big exhibition in um, National Gallery Warsaw, I, it came to me suddenly that I would like to 
honor her especially that she wouldn't have this gap of for, for being forgotten and um, uh, at the same time I wanted to make a bridge in between Polish art and international art so I decided and I also was thinking about this um, group way of thinking which you already uh, um, iron you mentioned so much that that the, the the creating urinal was never a process of one person and even that this masculinization of that it has to be a man name in front of this art like it was with Christo and Jean-Claude for decades yeah uh, so I was thinking okay let's change it radically and let's make a a prize for artists which would be not named for one person but it would be named for two different but linked somehow person and let's also uh, introduce this uh, art prize for several people so each year we nominate for three prizes for young uh, polish artists uh, for uh, Polish woman artists um, of the of the um, uh, um, for the life achievement, I would say, and then the uh, international great artist who is visible through the borders. You know, we also gave um, give uh, her um, our prize for the first edition. It was Karoli Schneemann. Uh, who just got the prize just just before she passed away and the next year last year it was uh, Filida Barlow so this year it would be the third edition and also we sort of um, run <laughs> after this gap of that women ha was were so so less um, awarded during the 20th century we live in the post emancipation um, century but we still have this before emancipation attitude that for example I was sudden, uh, one day counting the uh, Polish um, one of the Polish very important prize uh, which is officially given by government and there is only 50% of women even though this prize is after our liberation independence times so of 1918 when Poland become uh, Poland again as an independent country in Europe so so that was my idea and uh, for the first edition we would like to uh, give this prize to women only so for three years we would have at least nine uh, women already selected which is a, already a little society together with the committee which is uh, only one man uh, but then five or six women in it and we invite each artist each year one of the artists who was um, uh, who was awarded last year so I believe we create a very beautiful and very um, heavy quality society of artists together with two not patrons I would say but two matrons Maria Anto and Elsa von Freitag Lorinhoven uh, so that that is the the idea and I'm I'm very glad that is slowly slowly this uh, this prize together with all these women which uh, get to know each other uh, sometimes it's a really nice meeting like artists are surprised that they were really they never they never got any prize you know they have the 60s they have the 70s they never was prized before which is actually why is that i i'm asking you know me myself i also only got once a prize but um, uh, but uh, some of our artists, uh, of our uh, artists who were awarded, uh, just never was appreciated as they should be because a really, really great, uh, fantastic person. Um, 
yeah, so that was the, the main description of, of the uh, Elsa von Fre uh, Maria Anto and Elsa von Freitag art prize. A very good initiative um, and very good point. Matrons and not patrons. You're very, very right. Uh, we have to be very careful with uh, our language when we refer to these matters. I was introduced to this discussion about uh, Fonten, uh, Duchamp and Elsa by Siri Hustvedt, uh, who was our guest a few years ago, when her book, when her novel, The Blazing World, uh, was translated into Polish, she came uh, to Krakow and we discussed the novel and uh, everything around it. And that was the moment when I uh, was introduced to the controversy. I started to follow it and I was absolutely struck by subtexts that were immediately um, uh, immediately evoked by arguments, uh, by um, texts written uh, by female and uh, male uh, critics, art historians, and so on. I had a feeling that this discussion about Elsa, about uh, Marcel, and about Fonten was immediately uh, moved to a different field um, in which the most important thing was activated uh, gender bias um, affecting uh, this discussion and the field of art, the field of culture in uh, general. Irene, uh, would you agree that this element was, was there? Uh, it was not only a discussion about who is the author of certain work of art, but who could be who is allowed to be an author. Absolutely, there is certainly this element of social justice in there, and that is what propels it. And I think that's what we see in Hustwitz's novel, for example, which is very evidently a, um, a, a work of fiction. And so whatever we do in a work of fiction, uh, uh, you know, I'm very, very comfortable with these claims and I'm very comfortable uh, with that. It becomes different when we make statements in public about singular authorship and so on. So we may not necessarily help the cause, but we may help those who say uh, this is all a lie, it's all fake news, whatever. And um, but I totally agree with you. What is propelling all of this is that very strong sense of um, a women's art uh, of being submerged, uh, not having had its platform for such a long time. And uh, uh, that's what kind of legitimizes some of the language within this broader discussion that um, uh, Baroness Elsa being involved in the sculpture God, uh, being uh, the author of, 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 of sculpture Limswish. Um, Limswish has gained uh, its following, it's being exhibited worldwide these days, but it certainly does not have the stature of uh, a fountain. And um, and one might argue that there, there is, and I think it's, you know, there's a lot of evidence that an ingrained bias is still in place, that uh, women's work, even today, is worth less, it's auctions for less, it's um, uh, being considered not, not quite as, as, as valuable as that of male art, because there is a kind of system that still supports uh, the, the old structures. And so I certainly commend Susanna for her fantastic initiative in naming this beautiful prize and giving a women uh, a platform to be celebrated. The Baroness never received a prize for her work in her lifetime. She had to struggle to earn uh, a little money and she earned her uh, keep through modeling in the nude until, you know, deep in, not deep into her 50s, but into her early 50s until she died. You know, she was kind of launching a new modeling agency. Um, 
in order to um, in order to uh, earn an income. So I find that very interesting uh, that, that this inability to to make a living uh, from her art and um, you know not being uh, celebrated. We have to give credit though at the time too. I mean there were prescient women including Juna Barnes, who helped her at the time, who wanted to help her publish her first book of poetry. And that's the reason, of course, this did never materialized uh, after she died in 1927. And uh, we, my collaborator, whose name, by the way, is also Suzanne, uh, and I, we, um, uh, published the uh, first edition of the Baroness Elsa's poetry in 2011 in Body Sweats. And uh, I was so proud because this was then decades and decades after the Baroness's death. And so it's basically a kind of posthumous acknowledgement of her work and of her contributions. And uh, I think with all of that, we certainly pay tribute to all of them who uh, are able to propel women's art, uh, the art of other minorities as well, you know, that we should acknowledge and that we, 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 we need to, um, uh, to, to do our part, let's say, in this fight against uh, social injustice. Uh, it's, it can only happen if we all engage with these issues together and if we acknowledge them. Uh, series novel, uh, The Blazing World, presents an artist uh, who is unrecognized until the moment when she hides herself behind an avatar of her friend, male friend. Uh, uh, Siri uh, uh, makes a reference to Elsa in her uh, last novel, Memories of the Future. Uh, you uh, do a lot of great work presenting these authors, presenting these artists, um, paying tributes. Uh, Susanna, Susanna uh, creates uh, an award, but the problem is systematic and we still need other tools, other instruments uh, to change the system. So my question uh, to all of you is, uh, what uh, can we do, what else can we do uh, to change the foundations of this mentality behind the system? and to uh, not only repair, because it's not, uh, uh, it's not enough to change only bits of the system, only tiny elements of it. We should uh, rethink it, reshape it uh, in a general way. So what else can be done? Uh, it's my question uh, to all of you. So maybe now it's my turn. <laughs> Yes, I think that um, um, as we talk about uh, fountain, uh, it was such an unusual way of circulation, uh, which is with uh, gossip, with rumor, with photograph, and it is uh, in fact um, a piece of art which haunted us. Yes, so I think that. Um, uh, the strategy of the fountain is very interesting for uh, uh, thinking about the strategy of how women artists uh, uh, can be more visible. It is not um, uh, a moment we can do that, <laughs> but it is a process, a long process, because as we see in the fountain, uh, it was uh, not submitted, so you may say that it is a failure, but uh, uh, its failure wasn't a failure at all, because uh, there were friends uh, who uh, collaborated, who make fun out of, of, uh, of this failure. And uh, for instance, very soon, a wonderful article in Mercure de France uh, in uh, Paris uh, appeared, and uh, Guillaume Apollinaire was uh, very happy about uh, uh, the fountain and surprise uh, because he didn't, he, he loved something which is unexpected, yes? So um, I think that 
du champ euh, created a sort of net and this net uh, was grassroots and we now know that it is uh, um, misogynic but in fact um, uh, this is what we can do uh, uh, the failure which isn't a failure but but a process uh, of uh, which uh, transform the failure into success so i i i i, uh, I think about um, uh, that uh, uh, like that and um, uh, it shouldn't be only a fight yes let's not think about uh, being milit uh, militant and all, also in this belligerent terms <laughs> because Dada was something very um, joyful. Fountain times uh, and Dada times was uh, the most uh, uh, lovable time. Uh, I think that also not only for Duchamp but also uh, for uh, Elsa. Uh, Baroness Elsa. So uh, we shouldn't um, uh, be only belligerent. This is very important to uh, to uh, to have a sense of humor. And um, when we think about strategy, uh, uh, please um, let me recall a very funny strategy by, uh, of Professor Gamel because it really uh, struck me when she. Uh, was describing the death of uh, um, Baroness Elsa and her uh, dog Pinky. And he said, well, maybe she didn't die like Achilles uh, on the battle crowd, <laughs> battleground, by, but like Agamemnon, yes? So she's uh, doing such a, uh, uh, in her home, yes? Uh, coming back from the battle. So, uh, it is very funny, um, uh, such a comparison, but it's completely crazy because uh, she's comparing a mythological uh, persons to, uh, um, to, to, to the woman uh, who has nothing in common with these uh, uh, great heroes of uh, Homer. And in, uh, by doing it, uh, uh, she shows, uh, she's uh, showing uh, at the same time uh, the black humor because this is about death, uh, yes, maybe suicide. So this is black uh, humor, but it is also a sort of subversion, yes. Uh, okay, when you really want heroes, here you are. Uh, here you, uh, we have another hero. Okay, this is our Agamemnon. Uh, this is as a uh, Baroness uh, von Freyta Klarinhaven, and this is so um, amazing, astounding for me. Uh, so uh, when we uh, think about strategies, yes. I think that the most uh, amazing strategies are really great. Um, uh, well, I wrote a book about um, not divi dividing uh, uh, hairs because I wanted to say that uh, uh, Duchamp wasn't belligerent and he, uh, his art is not about divisions. Yes, that we are on one side and on the other side because he's doing something very ambivalent so uh, every now uh, uh, we are now fighting one uh, army against another army and uh, we should remember that Dada was uh, in such a very special position um, of, sub of uh, subverting uh, and uh, uh, black humor and humor and uh, prank and not uh, uh, um, and not only um, so serious yes uh, as uh, as you we, because yes systematic um, exclusion is very serious problem yes but uh, we are on the platform of art and um, at, it is really another thing <laughs> okay. Uh, Susanna, Irene, would you Sorry, like to? I, I was. Yeah. I must say that I 
uh, in art, unfortunately, there is also systemic uh, exclusion and is very, very visible. Um, I also checked, for example, the collection of uh, Museum of uh, um, Modern Art in Poland, which is the most progressive, the most beautiful, fantastic uh, um, um, institution in Warsaw. Uh, with the new building which is uh, uh, during uh, construction process and then again we have uh, less than 40% uh, 37 5 to 37 because some works is difficult to adjust to 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 the certain uh, gender but still a women is only 35 percent of the uh, collection and we are talking about last century again the post uh, emancipation century when women together with men are finishing academies of fine arts and participating in not only movement like dada but also other movements and um, art uh, uh, during the, uh, the century. So uh, it is still a certain habit that uh, um, acquisition of the, of the works are, uh, are uh, um, rather male colleagues, artists, and the prices uh, on the art fairs, for example, on the auction, as you mentioned already, Iron, um, it's it's uh, sorry I should maybe say Irene. Uh, what uh, it's it? Irina actually. I, I pronounce it the German way or the French way. Or Irene, uh, oh, not so much Irene. <laughs> I'm sorry. So it's much easier and uh, well, much more natural for me to say Irene. Sorry to miss uh, spelling your name. Um, or mis, uh, mis, uh, reading. Uh, so uh, you mentioned already this auction prices, which is, uh, we know about this, but you have to maybe know that here in Poland, we also have a very, very strange situation concerning academies of fine arts, when, for example, in Warsaw Academy of Fine Arts, as far as it was uh, checked uh, two, three, four years ago, it was no, not more than 15, to 18% women teaching. So it is really, as uh, it is a disaster, I would say, because how can you uh, really uh, give a certain um, process of teaching to the, to the generation of young people without introducing them to the, to the way of thinking of uh, artist women, to, to the way of thinking of creating in a new way, which includes also other the, um, specific uh, methods and techniques and, and attitude by women artists, as including our Elsa von Freytag, who I think was her way of thinking inspired uh, Duchamp and others. I'm sure about this because her uh, position and, and, and um, personality was really revolutionary at that time. Uh, and visual uh, and visible in this revolutionary way. So she was not silent. She wanted to be different. She, it's, it's, there is this famous anecdote about her uh, smoking cigarettes in the bar in Paris, yeah? When she, she was stopped, she was censored on the street that she cannot smoke on the street as a woman. She cannot be on the street without the, the head as a woman in the beginning of, sen, uh, of 20th century. We are silent, we artists now in the beginning of 21st uh, century. Also, in the other way, not because of smoking and not because of the heads, but because of other way of behavior, yeah? Like, for example, in this country, the most provocative and the most, uh, the most, uh, the very loud, loud uh, work, which was considered to be big scandal, was done by artists, women artists by Dorota Nieznalska, by uh, Katarzyna Kozyra, by myself as well with my project, I've seen my death. Um, and you know, 
uh, our colleagues artists men who did a similar thing they were fighting fighting for their position but not so much uh, uh, humiliated in this proposal, artistical proposal by other not artistic argues, you know, like we have this gender argues, moral argues, uh, mental argues, uh, um, you know, because artists, men, male artists could be crazy, but women artists, crazy women artists means crazy. It's another craziness. It's this worst craziness. There is better craziness and worse craziness. This is the craziness we want to listen and the craziness we don't want to listen. And, uh, you know, we should change it. We should really change our way to listen to. And this is the, the biggest role in all this process, in my opinion, is the role of art historian, because Elsa von Freitag is not included, not because Duchamp was a bad man, because people who write after for decades was excluded her. So art historian, academic uh, uh, critics, this is, that's their uh, work to be done. Because we artists, we, we work, we do what we can do, even more. And then this has to be verbalized, put on into the paper, print, read, given to the students as a course, as a way of discussing, discussing, thinking, inspiring. So this is this systemic exclusion is also in science unfortunately irene Eden. Uh, and i would just say i mean we're almost out of time but i i would say this just beautifully wraps up i think both the problematic and also the hope we have for effecting uh, the change that, that needs to happen and that we continue to work on. Uh, I love the focus on humor, on the connection that Anna talked about and that we certainly see embodied in somebody uh, like the Baroness Elsa. Um, I mean, I recall, you know, she was the sort of living data. The focus is on life. She always talked about motion emotion so those two things the corporeal were connected for her and it was something that she practiced in her everyday art so there was this element this life force that she embodied and that she presented on the streets of new york in some of the uh, salons uh, that uh, that she visited and uh, and elsewhere and it was inspirational for others and i think connecting with uh, uh, susanna's point i think it's so important to have these prizes that kind of validate the works of women specifically i really want to commend you for that initiative i think it's absolutely wonderful and uh, overall I think what we do and what is important, where I also see uh, my role, both as a uh, sort of literary and, and visual culture historian and a teacher, university teacher, is to communicate these ideas to the next generation. Uh, in Toronto, for example, I also do this through our research center. I'm the director of the Modern Literature and Culture Research Center at Ryerson University. This involves a lot of students. Many of them are women. The large majority is a women who are keenly interested in precisely this problematic and who are ready and willing to take their space within society, within professions, and make a difference on their own. So I think these are ways also in which we can instill uh, the, the, the sort of uh, need for change, discuss change, and also bring women artists 
into the classroom, uh, women-centered theories into the classroom, and I think all of these are part of uh, sort of addressing the social justice issues that, uh, that all of the speakers today uh, were, were mentioning. So thank you very much for providing this platform. It's been absolutely wonderful. Uh, I really like the point uh, that Fonten was created as collaborative, uh, collective effort. Uh, someone, of course, uh, has his name attached to this artwork, but behind it, there is a group of people uh, contributing uh, in this way or another. And I guess if we seek for systematic change, we can learn from this point. Uh, always look at the network, always look at the connections, always look at um, uh, relationships uh, between artists, critics, uh, art historians, people involved uh, to find a new way of thinking, a new way of acting. Uh, I learned a lot from, from you uh, that was really inspiring. I uh, hope our audience uh, will visit the exhibition uh, organized by Renata Kopeto and Dom uh, Norimberski. Thank you uh, for your comments. Thank you for your inspiring thoughts. And uh, I hope to see you soon in real and not only uh, through this medium of uh, technology. That would be lovely. Such a wonderful discussion. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for inviting me.